Hello and welcome to 15. I'm Luke. I've got Dan with me. Hi, Dan. Hello. Hi, uh, how are you doing? What are you up to? I'm doing Good. a podcast. Just reading a... <laughs> yeah. I've just been reading my uh, new book on Edward of the Longshanks. Do you know who that is? Is it a pirate? Nope. Good. Should it should be. It's King of England, Edward the First. Brilliant. All right, let's move on. Okay, so mm-hmm. this is the podcast in which we which watch the first 50 minutes of three films and choose one to watch in full in time for next week. The one we won last week is... The one we won. <laughs> I just fought for a second. Oh, wow, he's not going to jump down my throat there. Um, <laughs> what is, is that, is that me getting out of your front? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, last week was The Sea Beast, which was a bit of my mutually assured destruction. I wanted one film, down went to the other, so we just went for the one that neither was wanted. So, yeah. Dan, let's start with that then. The first 15 minutes weren't great. Did it get any no. better? No, it did not. Did it for you? <laughs> no. The cardinal sin for this film, which I think you'll probably agree with, is this was not funny. I'm no. not sure. I smiled at Blue, the little lovely little sort of anthropomorphized, but this is like a canine, wasn't he, as a monster. Yeah. But there was no humor. I didn't laugh out loud once, which is just, that's unforgivable in this. Sort of yeah. Thing. I found it. I mean, we've sort of both off camera said the same note and I've got it here that it was very comparable to how to train your dragon. Mm-hmm. Which so. th- that film, that film franchise does it so much better because it plays with expected norms it plays with stereotypes it's playing with all of those things and really averting them on the head these fearsome dragons are seen as dogs you know in that kind of their behavior these vikings who are fearsome killers are seen to have a softer side and it all kind of plays on its head and these kind of wrong perceptions this for me just didn't do anything and it sat in this really unresolved camp no no character had any kind of meaningful development and nothing was resolved story-wise like the king and queen were supposed to be bad and had been corrupting everything but all they did was run off at the end just ended we'll get to the end in a bit let's stick on i like your point of how training driving because we might say i also picked up on that it felt i mean you can sort of pay homage to but this was like derivative what how training did much better was it sort of intertwined myth and folklore a little bit better than this film does like this you can see where it's going it's so predictable you know it's going to get to like a monsters inc version of oh and they're actually quite good in the end but yeah. it didn't it never stayed off track it was linear it was obvious it was dull it was dull and it didn't but then i also thought there was real opportunity at time to go down some interesting ideas so we had quite a lot about propaganda that this girl is sort of from a point of view that the main character is we saw in the first 50 minutes she's reading a book about this captain crow and we kind of get this her coming to terms with these characters not being like a storybook and then she kind of learns it's kind of propaganda but it never went far enough we never really had the wool was never like pulled back over her eyes it was just like oh you're meant to be a really fearsome killer you kind of are but not in that way or mm-hmm. the monsters are meant to be really fearsome, you know, whereas how to train your dragon was, it was showing that the monsters were still monsters, but they had a softer side and that they were serving some greater beast. Whereas the crab beast, when red, the big, it was still attacking. It was still a horrible beast. Just mm-hmm. this beast quite liked them. There was no kind of redeemable quality about the beasts other than them essentially not being as well this one beast not being as killer as made out yet we've seen time and time again that all these other beasts are actually attacking the ships and do you know what i mean it wasn't all all of their characters to me felt uh, sort of going back to this paint by numbers approach Mm. let's look at the lead for example i I guess Maisie can be said to be the lead probably is but let's go back to the rogue he's a rogue he's a pirate he's been on a pirate ship his entire life it's now time for him to take the mantle and take over okay fine But he's not a rogue at all. There's a moment about maybe half an hour in or so where Maze is being difficult and he says, oh, send her home. And he's like, you know what I mean? And then he literally says, if that's okay. And it's just like, what's going on here? You're so scared of putting a foot wrong that you're losing everything from the characters. You're not putting anything right. Yeah. Yeah. No, 100%. I mean, let's get to... It does get a little bit better for me, but let's just sort of stay on this when it's shit because like this film by formula idea like for me i think 
kids are getting smart at this stuff. Like they've seen Shrek, they've seen all those sideways glances and plays with the form for animation films. And if you're not going to do that, surely kids can also see where the film's going. Like they absorb so much of this cinema. Yeah, I think this. That's interesting. You say that actually. Uh, something I hadn't considered because I always look at it very much and like a great kids film is doing two things, isn't it? It's playing at the kids level and playing at the adults level. Mm -hmm. But you, what you're saying here is that actually it's not competing on either level. Mm -hmm. It's sort of sitting in a halfway house. It definitely feels, I do agree with you a hundred percent that it feels like this has been storyboarded out mm -hmm. and too many people have had ideas like, there's kind of you can draw really like there's throughout kind of animation the last 10 years of 15 20 years of animation you can see kind of elements of all of it there's different elements of moana there's different elements of kind of shrek there's elements of kind of treasure planet mm -hmm. all films that do what they're doing better mm -hmm. i think no, um, I agree. I, I, there was even actually a moment where, well, let's get to the ending, actually. Yeah. I thought for a moment Mia was being a bit harsh because about an hour 10, when you sort of get the, the cuteness of Blue and all the animals, and, and there is a little bit of sense of joyousness to that, and I was won over a little bit. And when it had these moments where we saw the voyage trying to capture red and it was getting a bit darker and we had Kathy Burke getting herself a paycheck, you know, a bit of voiceover yeah, work. She's we, there. We, we love to see a bit of that. And it's doing this... Has she done any work since Tinker Taylor Soldier Spy? <laughs> Doesn't she like documentaries on rich people now? I'm sure she does like... Oh, random... Kathy Burke. <laughs> She's actually doing the life and um, times um, of Hilary DeVay. She's doing yeah. the narration of it. Yeah, she's been method acting those 40 cigarettes a day, hasn't she, to get ready yeah. for the role. Um, but these, this idea of the deal with the devil and that element and someone is, is willing to sacrifice everything, that stuff was quite good. But like you say, when we get to the end... And it's in this big plaza and it's like, okay, they're going to win. And then and it's already like a, like you say, a plaza. So it's like geared up for just a, a, a kind of Coliseum, a final right. battle. Right, Everybody's yeah, finale, watching. Yeah. It's, it's, it's not subtle. It's not, it's but, like, and now we're in the arena where the baddies are all going to have cannons pointing at the thing. And then all the crowd are watching and then the king, you know, it's all. But it was just so uninspired. The ending, yeah. and like, I have made like films before, like crappy documentary films, and I get to the end of them, and I'm so fed up. I just want them to end, and right. this is what reminded me of this film. It's sort of just you look, you have about twelve minutes left. You think, oh right, okay, what's going to have kind of a second wind here, so to speak? What's going to happen? And then it sort of has two minutes. It sort of really heads towards an ending. The screen goes black, and you go, wait a minute, is that over? The king and queen just run off. No resolution there. Uh, they go and live on an island. A fifty, a forty-year-old guy and a young girl. This girl. What's going on there? With a but we also, monsters. but I wouldn't say we've developed this really paternal bond between either, you know, daughter. Like it's not like he's adopted her and learned so much more about them. No, it's, it's not I, like it's like that. Sully to jump to Monsters Inc. Like Sully and Boo in hmm. Monsters Inc. That's a beautiful like paternal relationship. We don't get any of that here at all. But, you see, the thing for me with this is, and I think this comes down to a kind of character storyboarding, doesn't it always screenplay ultimately, but this kind of rogue character sort of is what's throwing everything off. Because actually, if you had the grizzled captain determined to go and seek his revenge, let's break it down into kind of quite a basic story. If you had a grizzled captain seeking revenge and you implement a little girl and actually all his crew turn on him because she brings a ray of joy and she kind of opens their eyes, that would make sense then because there's a both characters are learning something from each other. But mm -hmm. what we've actually got is a grizzled captain who's unrelenting in his change. You've got this rogue character who's trying to play to him. It, this rogue character is almost the mediator for both, but he doesn't do any well enough to kind of explain the story. What happens to this grizzled captain? What Captain Crow? He just sort of buggers that's my, off. That's my point entirely. Like they all become he, unemployed. They've all got yeah. one vocation. They can't do anything else. Like imagine a blacksmith. But we don't see. No went to that. school. That's all he ever did. And at the end, he goes, "And you've lost your job." But everyone says it in a really nice way. You've lost your job. Plastic. <laughs> yeah, plastics come and usurped you. And you just sat there like dazed, and it ends. We don't have any. I mean, I'm big on not always wrapping stuff up. Fine, a bit of ambiguity. But this wasn't ambiguity. This was just rushed. Yeah, there was just no conclusion to it. 
That's my biggest issue with it. It was it we teetered. We had real moments of okay, power corruption. Um, you know, damaging environments, killing beasts. You know, kind of hunting. I suppose propaganda. Um, you know, lots of really interesting things that could have been explored, mm-hmm. and it wasn't it just kind of felt like a painting by numbers one thing i will say is and we did say this in the first 50 minutes there was some incredible underwater scenes in fact the whole water was just done very the well animation was excellent uh, but excellent but you expect that and if your animation's going to be poor in an animation film then it's it you're already lost haven't you so it, you kind of expect that as we said in the 15 minutes before you know law of diminishing returns so it didn't explore anything in the right way. It's kind of directly stealing from a film that's doing this so much better. Mm-hmm. But even if you're going to kind of not explore that and copy it, at least resolve your film. And this didn't. Um, one thing I did like, though, the fight scene on top of Red was quite good. Oh, really? I was I was almost... I didn't have any engagement, to be honest, about that. That's point. fair I was really enough. Struggling. Yeah, but he just sort of he's meant to be this fearsome captain and he kind of was, and I kind of get Oh that. yeah. I like that. He might, he almost mold, you know what I mean? Yeah. That he's prodigy, which was good. Um, yeah. Like I said, the animation, it shouldn't go amiss. Like what, it doesn't matter if you put this up against a film with, uh, inadequate, not inadequate, something like the cell, um, Iron Giant or something, you know what I mean? It pulls apart in terms whoa, of animation. No, whoa, whoa. let's not take pot shots at the Iron Giant. No, in terms of animation, it pulls apart but in terms of what you'd actually rather watch. In terms of story, it's not even close. So just uh, ebbing back to this idea Which of one story. Is it? Just so you can say that on camera, please. <laughs> sea Beast. <laughs> um, but we need to talk about this again. All the way through the film, we talk about, we heard about Jeopardy. We heard about right. Maisie's parents dying. We heard about oh, losing people at sea and everyone dies a hero. Not a single crew member died the no. entire film. Oh, there's no Jeopardy here. It, it, what, what was the point in any of this? Like you, yeah. I guess you think, oh, well, you just care about the sea monsters, but the sea monsters. But none of them die. Or none does that die. one at the start? That one oh. that's a real evil one that's attacking a helpless crew. Yeah, the sort of colossal squid-like yeah. creature. But also, the accents. I went through the cast. Now, these casts are actually British. I was amazed that they were all British because the accents are so poor and so <laughs> on the nose, but not on the nose in a good sense, just like so... They're very sort of Errol Flynn, I'm doing a pirate, sort of, <laughs> aren't they? They are. The, they. I mean, they're going for it. You know what I mean? They're swinging for the fences with their accents. Also, um, seawater. Dan, all I could think, especially when those scenes where the, the sea monster would go back under the water and back out, how were they not constantly spitting seawater <laughs> out and their lips would be all dry and cracked? And Oh, I would not be a pirate. So what you're saying is the science doesn't check out? The yeah. science of being a pirate? Well, I guess so. It just shows how, how poor I would be in the circumstances, maybe. You um, need to be a salty sea dog. Do you have much else to add on this one? No. Unfortunately, I was fully committed to really enjoy this i love a swashbuckling film but it doesn't come anywhere near what's good enough but that is interesting though like we talk about this film should embrace that swashbuckling buccaneering nature and have that energy and it, it doesn't it falls flat and i think that's because it didn't like you say maybe you didn't put this development and this time in the characters and really understanding the characters and having them noteworthy it didn't go near that and it struggled yeah just got my ten thousand step Wave my arms around. <laughs> uh, what did you give it out of 10? Four. Yeah, four. four. Same. Exactly the same. Okay, right, Dan. Below let's average. Go. Let's go <clears> to <throat> the first of our trio then this week. This Absolutely. is brand spanking new. This is so Spank new. Me. This is from the Russo brothers who've done Avengers, Cherry. Dan, I haven't seen any of those films. I haven't seen a single Russo brothers film. What can I expect from this uh, partnership? They certainly know how to do fight scenes very well. And something that I sort of said in my review privately to you when I saw Cherry was that the film was quite epic in scale, but very much felt like films within films within films and didn't really mesh together. And one thing they do know how to do is big action, which is something we definitely saw in this opening. My goodness, what a direct opening. Thrown in, no messing around. Um, Speaking of no messing around, by the way. Um, I love the dialogue over the intertitles. I am when I when, don't, when we don't watch these films at the same time, just a peek behind the curtain. I was a touch late on watching my films, so I was having to try and get through them. Dan was on time right. this time. 
first time for everything. And you want to say I time usually, anymore in that sentence? I <laughs> just one more time. <laughs> I um I skip through the intertitles. What are you watch... listening to? Cindy Lauper. <laughs> I don't watch the first forty seconds. I get to skip through them and I make up a bit of time. So you, um, so sorry. Just so we're clear, you're doing fourteen twenty. Yeah. <laughs> But I could Hi, welcome this. to 14, 20, 20, 20. They added to a dynamic start, do you know what I mean? And, and the use of them being a, a, a cell and having mm. his crime record read, read to him by Bill on phone to the old people, love that, meant what? the exposition was handled pretty well, didn't yeah. feel didn't feel jarring at all. And Billy Bob Thornton and title. Ryan Gosling on screen together, aren't they lovely? Like quality <laughs> actors just doing quality things. I've said this before, like it's, it sounds like really dumb, but not enough films do it. They try and do too many bells and whistles. Just keep the camera in one place. You've got Ryan Gosling, who I've never really seen him like this before, as this sort of quite... Grizzled? No, no, well, that, but also this quite enigmatic and quite sort of wild, a little bit untamed character in mm-hmm. the cell, which it seems a lot more demure the more we go into the first 15 minutes. He obviously composed himself. But I quite like that. He's got he's a prisoner. Do you know what I mean? He's at prison. He's in prison for 40 years. Like he's gonna be a bit unhinged. And then you've got this kind of I, I struggle to see him in anything but sort of the Fargo uh retinue. Mm-hmm. But Billy Bob Thornton just doing cool, calm and unplacable. Um, yeah. I always I'm all, I always sort of get up out of my seat when I notice Billy Bob Thornton's in a film because he's he's famously incredibly picky. Mm. So I'm always a little bit like, okay, this might be quite good. If Billy Bob signed it off, or he just needs a bit of money. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's one of the two. Um, same you to... don't have the same effect on Kathy Burke, but there you go. <laughs> let's, let's talk about the, the cast then. You know you know I'm a Ryan Gosling fan. My goodness. Yeah. I love Ryan Gosling. Um, now, Chris Evans, not that one, Um I haven't, I haven't actually, taken a time out from Virgin Radio. I saw him in uh, Knives Out when I wasn't Virgin Radio. I, I wasn't enamored by what he did. And he's obviously Captain America, but I haven't seen that. Um, does he usually play a baddie? I'm quite interested, just intrigued to see that he'll play a baddie here. Um, he he's baddies. a baddie. He was a baddie he, in Knives Out, wasn't he? Yeah. Yeah, but he's like a troubled teen, annoying, you know, trust fund kid. He wasn't like a baddie. No. Well, it wasn't Did he cut a bit close to the bone? Is that where you got a problem with him? And then uh, Anna the Armist is in this, uh, yeah. playing a slightly more believ- believable secret agent than she did in, uh, <laughs> yeah. in the latest Bond. Sort of ballet, kick-ass, sort of all the time on her back. <laughs> Not for the Bond reason. That was so British. kick ass. <laughs> <laughs> this the uh, guy sporting a Newcastle jumper. Um, yeah. Uh, let's get to uh, the plot then. I liked right. this. This is interesting. I did. We have off grid, in commas, grey uh, secret agents who were circulating the g- globe, and he was meant to be on this case, but he's close enough to it and he's got a good track record, so he jump pounces on it. Mm-hmm. We've got treachery between the people giving the commands and playing off almost not teammates, but essentially in the same role against one another. Yep. That was quite nice and interesting. Like, there's enough layers here for me to be intrigued. Do you know what I mean? Because it, hopefully it's not going to be all action. This, I agree. This felt to me, and I felt like this was a Bond opening because mm-hmm. it was really dynamic and really direct and we kind of were straight in the action. And there was no... It was quite lean, actually. It was, we like you just said, we know who all the players are. We're even shown a little bit of political movering in this kind of CIA because this experimental program where they're off-grid, these grey men, is kind of frowned upon. Mm-hmm. And we've got these characters not really wanting to use them and yet achieving means. But then there's kind of duplicity and corruption all going on. So we get through that really quickly in 15 minutes. It's really well paced. I felt like we covered a lot of ground yeah, and a lot well happened. Um, and that's kind of what you want, because on an enthralling kind of spy film, you need that groundwork done early to then have those moments of more tenderness or, you know, light and shade, essentially. So I was, I was sorry, about I, this. I was trying to remember the bit. What is the, the sequence in Skyfall where it's an, a, a sort of covert mission and he's on his own and he's walking parallel down the buildings and his whole that whole sequence. And I remember when I was watching Skyfall for the first time, I'm thinking that I'm like, wow, Bond's grown up a bit. 
Like, you know I mean, Bond feels really swanky, and it has those elements here, obviously, when we're in Bangkok. No, not, it's not Skycall, is it? Isn't it the Mexico scene in Spectre? No, no, it's like it's one at night time. It's almost like he's in Vegas or somewhere. I'm not sure where he is. Oh, it's when he's attacking the assassin in the big tower block. That yes, one. tower block, that's it. And they're like, all those bells and whistles are here. I liked mm-hmm. it. Now, the fight scene, this is somewhere I disagree with you. I think, although it was, it went for it in scale, you know what I mean, balls to the wall, but the actual fighting, it didn't have that impact for me. It didn't, I don't know that, I didn't feel that ferocity. I didn't, I didn't have the camera in with them. I, I don't know, I felt Did very you not like the shots in this sort of, well, yes, it did feel should have just let them fight. <laughs> <laughs> but did you not feel that <laughs> very, like, in the, right in the, the cinematography was doing quite a lot for me there because it was in, they were fighting in this, like, um, firework boat, aren't they? So it's, they've got yeah. this explosion and joy and light above and you've got this kind of quite gritty fight going on below and they're kind of playing around with that you didn't you didn't kind of warm to that it, i liked it but i couldn't help but feel like these guys have been given netflix's endless budget and they have to have a fight scene and we went oh uh, fireworks you know from the mean? russo brothers this is what you'll expect they are okay. very good at doing this kind of action this very kind of staged action which is what avengers kind of is it's kind of kapow um this is kind Sorry, of kapow, kapow makes me think of old batman you know when they win the tights yeah kapow yeah punch. um right um, anyway uh, anything, one thing i just i did lose myself actually in this opening minutes and i actually ran to 18 before i realized oh bugger i meant to be that's ironic because you also found yourself in bangkok didn't you dan i've never been lost yourself yeah yeah you said to get about ping pong ball <laughs> no it wasn't <laughs> It was about your trip to Southeast Asia. Anyway, okay. go on. You were saying you... That euphemism. You... <laughs> um, I'm, I'm going to leave that one. Uh, sorry, you are saying you, you got... Where do distracted. the Southeast Asians go to get suitable neckwear? Well, I was going to, I was going to say, it is weird that a, a region so with, <laughs> with private parts is known as the South of the region. Anyway, um, should we move on then? Kind of fuming you didn't laugh at Thailand. <laughs> to be fair, if you put that one into this next review, it wouldn't make me laugh. It'd be quite jarring. So this one, we're on the streets of London. This is Guy Ritchie's debut, I'm pretty sure. Which is well, catapulted him anyway. 1998, lock, stock, two lock, stock and two smoking catapults. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> um, and obviously he went on to do Snatch, The Gentleman, <laughs> Sherlock Holmes. Talking about Aladdin, the Southern reason. I think he did, which was weird. Aladdin. Anyway, Let's get to this. This is definitely seems like Aladdin, a the new Aladdin. Apparently, apparently yes. I didn't I know that. That in his resume. Uh, but this, it definitely seems like a film that's very much focused on language to me. That was the most pertinent okay. part of this film. It's a lot about dialects, cadence, vernacular, all this stuff, accent, nice. and it's and that helps create the tempo and set the tempo. Now, I do feel this tempo is almost chucked off board, of of course, sorry, by cheesy weird comedy moments that don't land and okay a director who's very obsessed with style like these sort of slow-mo moments these quick turns this sort of tarantino-esque moment I mean, it felt a bit edgar wright to me actually yeah kind of um yeah, it does. that kind of whoo, 100%. Um, sound yeah. effects for like just random movements yeah definitely anyway I'll let you talk what do you think of well this i thought I, for me there was actually some really nice shots going on and some lovely cinematography the one i'm thinking of is where we've got the kind of um on the you're on the street view of the two apartments and you see the four boys go in and then you see the four other boys go into the other house and there's mm-hmm. this kind of mini mart in the middle or whatever it is i really like that shot and there was a couple of other kind of tracking Sorry, what shots. were you watching i don't remember that shot it was just mini a little fr- were you not watching dale's supermarket sweep were yeah you? that's it <laughs> good to so see luke's past. bringing the comedy you know <laughs> like this film bringing... couldn't so i said how dare yeah. i <laughs> well i mean crowbar in it in christ <laughs> it was thailand was southeast asia <laughs> you weren't even um, you weren't even right continent so you enjoyed but you can tell this is low budget can't you that's not that's not meant to be you know you can't hurt it too much for that but apart from the no. fact when it starts to look a bit like eastenders the, yeah, the did, tanning yeah, salon this sort of Vinnie hard nut acting, 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 rather of just sort of you know swagger and bluster and oh I'm odd and bang and bang and bang you know it's sort of <laughs> and what <laughs> <laughs> in the, yeah the back salon. to Thailand <laughs> yeah it's very it's got that kind of inverted commas very British or very East End 
Mm. Um, yeah, it is. Which I put question mark sexy beast because it has that kind of feel to it mm. um, of a very kind of gangster led gritty Landon or right, boys how you doing kind of thing. Interesting. It feels but I'm bit... not sure it will go. Yeah. That. Maybe it's like too far to say it feels a bit like Carry On Sex of Beast because Sex of Beast has a certain gravitas to it. I don't right. think this quite has. But like, I tell you what, though, I don't know if I should be saying this, but Jason Statham has star quality. Like, he still does. He's the one you, you see think out. He's exceptional in Spy. You know who I think he is. Yeah. Um, but in this, he, he leaps off the page, doesn't he? Off the screen. Yeah. He is very, very good. I do like him a lot. Um, but I'm intrigued by this. It feels like it's going to be quite... Rock and Roller, which is a different film. Mm, um, by him. But, That's his. Yeah. But yeah. Um, quite that kind of no holes barred. And we've got these kind of two factions and they're going to be off against each other. It's going to very much celebrate what it means to be that kind of London culture. Mm-hmm. Um, my my sort of issue. Yeah, exactly. My issue comes in, like, like you said, it's like a sort of character, isn't it? Character was character driven, all this stuff. But when you make these characters unsavory, and to dislikable, mm. I think this this is a heist film, right? So at some stage you're going to be in jeopardy. You need to care about these characters, and if they're too unsavory, then the film loses. But that I'm connection. I'm prepared to give the, the benefit of the doubt and say they can win me. Like I'm not, it's, I'm not against this film. I think they can do it, but I'm not certain they will do it. Yeah, it just it just has these watchable and this dynamism, this this sort mm. of quality to it, which. Can it can it keep up that pace? Maybe I, I don't think it's going to change. You know what I mean, and, and it, it feels quite not singular because I'm sure this has been done before. But for myself, this is not the sort of films I usually watch, and I was right. I, I was a little bit captivated by it. I quite liked it. Mm, it just wasn't well. the, the comedy moments didn't yeah didn't work. You need to take a few tips from me, Guy Ritchie. Uh-huh. You know, um, yeah. two so, bit minutes after the beat, say something about supermarket sweep. <laughs> Dale Winton always gets a laugh. <laughs> to be fair, in other contexts... What was would, our old joke about work. Dale Winton? You open the coffin and he's orange. His skeleton's orange. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, he's dead now as well. Anyway, <laughs> gone too soon. All right. Um, okay, let's move on to this then. So this is uh, Flea, this. 2001. <laughs> Flea, the 2001 um, animated documentary. Um, now, 2001? This... Sorry, 2021. I did that last week as well. Yeah, you did. <laughs> I'm going to be taking off duties very soon. Um, this lends a lot, sorry, takes a lot from Waltz with Bashir, which I'm not sure if you ever got around to seeing, but this is an animated documentary from like 2008. And this right. is so similar. 2008? I, yes, not 2008. Yeah, I got that one right. Um, but this is, that film like this one, I, I was adamant it was at least the same producer, same director, not at all. So it's just copying but it's a film about it's an animated documentary about dealing with memories and trauma right Right. and going back through a memory that they haven't addressed and haven't told the people around them who they love and then this is exactly the same it's also very good don't get me wrong but this is so similar to that film luke where does saddam hussein keep his cds (laughs) i don't know dan where does he keep his cds in iraq (laughs) (laughs) very good um, right. Let's so, get did to... you see this was Riz Ahmed and Nicola Costawaldu? Oh yeah, did, as executive I... producers. Yeah, but it's also because they're on. Apparently, if you listen to it dubbed, they are the um, the voices. The oh voices. right, that makes sense. Because I struggled a little bit of a watching problem. Struggled to get the subtitles on, so watched. I had to go watch four yeah. minutes. No, I watched. Well, I'm thinking, I'm, where's I'm the language? Idiot, where? But I yeah. watched a minute. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> swipe uh, let's talk about the animation <laughs> then because obviously animated film i love the texture mm, of this and uh, I, I did a bit of research great. and apparently he okay i did a bit of research <laughs> and apparently he used he used 10 different animators and i like that in a film that's documentary so mm. it doesn't have to be so not coherent it's not the right word but like documentary is it, i what i love about documentary films is when you start a documentary film you don't know where it's going to end up right mm-hmm. and that serendipity bleeds into the film and good documentary film workers just follow the story and have a sense of where they should go with the film and the text is changing made me feel that sort of way i i love that did you say you didn't like it or you didn't like these so, so i enjoyed the mixing of styles i liked how we jumped from real archive footage mm. of um Afghanistan. It was Afghanistan, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So archive footage of Afghanistan to this kind of almost drawn style of animation for memory. 
Um, it's like the take on me music video yes. when, when it was actually and more even had take on me didn't it so that kind of kind of brush stroke or maybe kind of pencil stroke mm-hmm. um and then but i the did sounds though the sounds were good as well you heard the pencil on the yes. on the paper that was lovely i didn't like the i can appreciate it but i didn't like the kind of static animation that the main story was following oh. i actually found it a little bit it didn't engage me it didn't immerse me enough and I actually thought what I wrote was anom- the Anomalisa style of acting. I would have loved to have seen mm. do this film because I think we're exploring, again, something you just said about the animation style is texture and that feel. And obviously that was all kind of puppetry, but kind of woolen puppetry, wasn't it? So there was that. But it, the, this story is obviously going to be something very tender, but about a, a gay man in a kind of Muslim country also then fleeing from kind of persecution and war-tornness. So I felt that kind of a more textured approach, a kind of softer, would be a more interesting style to play on. I haven't seen Mm -hmm. enough to kind of come down either way, but for me, I wasn't kind of getting drawn into that animation. I was looking more for the archive footage and the the pencil strokes. Um, But I did like... Oh, sorry, go on. I don't don't mind those rough moments, though, because I think this film was almost high, not hyper focused but it definitely made a point to focus on body language of the characters and so if your stuff is rough and almost jittery then you notice facial movements a little bit more and i like that it was placing the emphasis on that like so much so much clever uh, work going on here like this this is exactly an, this is such an interesting way to tell a story and that's yes. what i really enjoyed and the, the whole off camera moment like right, can we take a pause for a moment i didn't feel contrived no. and you have I'm talking to a documentary filmmaker off camera, but we're obviously still seeing it because it's an animation. You have to still produce and see what's going on here. All that stuff was, it was so clever. This is a very it's definitely clever how, film. how we would explore the animation style, isn't it? Mm-hmm. I think it definitely appeals to us. We've spoken a lot about doing stuff where it, if we would have the opportunity and the ability, we'd do that. We'd play around with that and cross into different kind of aspects of that. We'd have um, our characters I'd... scream and Dyson. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> turn on it six friends. I did in really enjoy that talking head because it kind of brought the focus back onto what he wanted to talk about versus what his life was about. Mm-hmm. Um, and I definitely, you know, it was very some very interesting and very clever things going on. Um, and I definitely think it's a film that's probably quite important. Um, mm-hmm. What was the film you said about before? Sorry, that is copy from two thousand and eight. Oh, Waltz with Bashir. It is, it's so similar to Waltz with I mean, that's, that's an exceptionally good film. So that's maybe this... Good. And it's also be... Middle Eastern. It's also sort of Middle Eastern-esque. I, I can't believe they're not connected, these two films. They are well, maybe so it's, similar. It's a homage and maybe it all... Maybe that will be this film's undoing or this film's making. It'll be better or worse or too much of a copy. But a, an interesting film, definitely. And um, for me, just I'm not sold on it quite yet. Um, One... That's interesting. I, I, I sort to see that. It, it's definitely a quiet taste, but some, I just my final comment really on the film is when it keeps playing with the linear timeline, right? And you're watching him go through boxes and look at memories, and sometimes he shows archive, but when he shows us a photo, he, he, he paints, he sort of animates it and so on. Yeah. All these moments keep reminding you that you're watching a documentary, and by doing so, it makes you imagine that this is a real human story. And I thought that was... I hope these are all intentional. I'm giving it the benefit of the doubt. I know a lot, but I think, yeah. it, was, I think it was very good. Um. Right, Dan, we should probably And you, you've done a winner there as well. You finally managed to sneak on a documentary. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Dan is, Dan's not always a big fan of documentary. I can sort of documentary see his point sometimes. Documentary film. Not film, Pocky. It's a course of films. Anyway, it doesn't matter. So, Dan, what do you want to watch out of this? This is... I wouldn't mind any. No, there I is one I want. And, yeah, I, we all know which one it is. Uh, if I choose Flea... And you choose uh, Grey Man. We watch Lock, Stock and Two Smoking Barrel. No, when, let's not start a precedent here. Right? Watch which one of the three did you like the most? Grey Man and captured, you know, captured me the most, enraptured me the most. Okay, good. Perfect. But I and might watch Man? Flea to get me into documentary film making. Oh, nice. Are we, are we not a little bit put off by Peter Bradshaw's review of the Grey Man? Are you? <laughs> Will you go you. against the Messiah? <laughs> No, I mean, I want to watch it. And, you know, it's the big one on Netflix to watch. It's the one by the water cooler. You know what I mean? Like you, you yeah. It's the one that's on there. But it's, it's a worrying. Two out of five stars from P Dog. P Diddy. That's a bit worrying. We still haven't read his book, it. have we? I didn't know he had a book. I said I got you it. <laughs> I you where it is. <laughs> Sorry. Um, <laughs> okay, we'll watch Grey Man in time for next week. Actually, one thing to finish on. 
Um, so this week I got offered a job in podcasting, which is quite nice. So I'm now actually going to work in podcasting. Anyway, got brought down to a, a bump, had a meeting today with one of our Australian, my Australian client, my sort of, you know, the new, what, in after. the new job or in the old no, job? No, in the old job. And she'd heard it. How did he say? Or how did she say? Sorry. Did you say good day? Embarrass yourself there. Um, she, <laughs> anyway, she heard I had a job in podcasting. I'm really excited. Start the call. And she goes, oh my God, are you excited? And I was like, yeah, I am. She goes, so are you working for Spotify or something? And it's just like, well, oh. I guess not really now. Like it's nowhere near as good as that. Oh, not nowhere near as good as that because new boss is watching. Very <laughs> honored. Thank you very much. But you know what I mean? It just sort of brings you down. It's like the idea when you tell We've someone, got mail. Yeah. yeah Luke's so, fired. <laughs> it's like when you ask your, your spouse, you go to get some milk or whatever, you ask him how much is Do it? Do you love then, me? And she says, no. <laughs> If I had a penny. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> For every divorce. <laughs> okay, let's just end it there. So right. I'm glad I'm in a very happy, loving relationship. For Because for a long time, you held the belief that I'd be a kind of man who'd been through a string of divorces. I still think you're going to be a spinster. <laughs> I, I still I still do. I still do. No offence to Grace. She's lovely, but I just do. Mm. A tragedy will befall her and you will be a spinster. <laughs> you know something I don't? Um, actually, next week we are going to try. Now, the next two weeks, me and Dan are both going on vacation, not together. No, we're not going on vacation. I'm off, we're going on holiday. I'm off to France, and Dan's off to Hull. Now, <laughs> we are going to try our best to record us real way, so our backdrops will be a little bit different. Mm-hmm. Um, As you know, I'm forever changing. Can't pin me down. Um, so, fingers crossed, we'll be back in ne- for the next two weeks. If not, we'll be back in three. Dan, enjoy Hull. Luke, enjoy Francais. Thank you. Bye, Dan. Bye, Luke.